Hello everyone, welcome to the Hard Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and today we're welcoming back a returning guest. He has a new book out right now that's called Skin That Screams. Oh, I love that fucking title. He is the unholy corpse child, Thomas Stewart. Thomas, welcome back to the Hard Room, brother. Welcome back indeed, Travis. <clears throat> so tell yes. us about this fucking awesome title, by the way, Skin That Screams. Tell us a little bit about that. So, Skin That Screams uh, was an idea that came to me twofold. First, it came to me after an idea I had last year from a book I'd published last year titled The Homicidal Artists, where I took 13 stories, 13 short stories I wrote, um, all original, all unpublished, and I decided to collect them into one themed tome. Whereas with the homicidal artists, however, it was all serial killers. This one I wanted to do to touch on a theme that was a little more personal to me, being body horror. As I believe I've shared before, I suffer body dysmorphia. So I wanted to sort of... I felt, you know... Given that I live through body horror, how hard could it be to translate that into my writing? So, so tell my audience for who, who don't know, what is body horror? Body horror is anything that depicts the degeneration or just the straight up um, deconfiguration of the human body. Um, essentially, think anything along the lines of David Cronenberg's The Fly, uh, Basket Case, The Blob, anything where that is mainly focus that has a focus around someone's body just falling apart or, um, rotting away on them, the degeneration of the body and there are many aspects to that because it could be through an external factor um or it could be as it was with me one's own doing the mind trying to destroy the body now, that's a deep and disturbing topic now, how long did it take you to come up with not only the idea, but also to get it on paper and get this book made? So, the stories themselves, much just like with the homicidal artists, all 13 stories included in this title were all written in a day. Um, yep. And it is shorter than the homicidal artists, but I've already have people telling me um, they love it, gruesome, and two people have now told me they've made the mistake of trying to eat while e reading it. Ooh! <laughs> I thought Pigman Pig would have told would have yeah made them learn not to try eating while reading any of my shit. But <laughs> now, as an author, I mean, you I've seen I read some of your writing. It is absolutely disturbing. Now, do you ever think as an artist, like, boy, I wonder how people are, are going to depict me as a person? Do, do people think I'm some kind of sick, twisted person, individual in real life? Occasionally. Occasionally, I have wondered that. I often like to use it to joke on myself. But that's one thing. That's the thing, Mr. Bruce. I've actually been depicted as that type of individual all my life, really, because I was always the oddball. Um, everyone's always thought I was the freak. Um, and occasionally that has got me into some big trouble. Um, but what I've realized is with writing, it, it's weird because if you try to if you try to portray any of that directly, any of those sort of thoughts or characteristics outwardly, people don't receive it. But portray it through fiction, 
and there's no qualms with it because I guess it's a way they can vicariously live through it without having to accept that it's a part of them as well. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, there, there, there's a huge fan base and there's a huge audience for body horror. I mean, there is. People love this shit. Who knew? Who fucking knew? I mean, I mean, I mean, when you first started writing uh, a body part, I'm, I'm assuming that you were a fan of, you read other um, authors' work. Um, primarily, yeah, in the realm of body horror, it was primarily shit like, um, Clive Barker, um, who I just sort of, I personally crown as one of the founders of Splatterpunk and, um, literary fiction, because I know, especially back in the day, there wasn't really a whole lot of self-published authors and companies weren't taking extreme horror. Yeah. Or at least if they were, it was severely limited. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, where it's much more available and there has been a market for it, especially as of recently, yeah, it, there's there's not a whole lot of fear about not finding a market. Now, of course, you're always going to have people that want to trash you in reviews saying that Splatterpunk is nothing but a sick and twisted fantasy that should have you put on a watch list. Something I actually have been told, by the way, based off wow. a story I wrote. <laughs> um, and, I mean, to the credit, yeah, it was a deeply yeah. disturbing one, but yes. So one thing about horror is horror has so many subgenres, whether it be movies, books, novels, whatever. It has so many subgenres that it's okay not to like everything. You know what I mean? It's okay not to like every. Like I'm not a huge Spider Punk fan, but I respect Spider Punk for what it is. And, I'll um, take that a step further, Mr. Bruce. Mm-hmm. Horror is, is an emotion that encapsulates more than just fear. It encapsulates yes. aspects of joy, humor, sadness, mm-hmm. agony, and exula- ex- exultation, even. Um, it's a genre that can encapsulate in every emotion on the spectrum. Correct. And because anytime I, I meet someone and they say, I do not like horror. Or I hate horror. And I'm like, have you ever seen or read every type of horror? Because there's, there's a type of horror for everyone. I mean, real life. I mean, I mean, our life is fucking horror. I mean, every look at news, look at, you know, your everyday life, you drive it in the street, you see fucking horror. 24 7. So, well, and horror, like horror. horror can be different things for different people. It can be. Um, I mean, for some, horror is simply as something as simple as losing your job or mm-hmm. getting called in on your day off. Yep. For others, it can be, of course, a lot more extreme, such as um, being involved in a car crash or watching somebody get gunned down on the street or what being present during armed robbery. There are there's so many aspects of it. Um, I mean, I'm my day job. I'm a mortician, right? So most people are scared of dead bodies. You know, they don't want to know. It doesn't bother me. It's my job. I see it on a daily basis, but horror to me is being a school teacher for a bunch of bratty kids. I could not do that. That sounds terrifying. That sounds scary to me. I that's one of the jobs that I couldn't do. Well, and then for some, horror is something that's not tangible. It's just existence. And that's that's actually something that that's been a thing for me. Um 
I guess you could chalk it up to reading too much Lovecraft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even as a child, oh, even as a child, um, certain just aspects of existence of always having a bigger picture has always frightened me on just some deep level. So what do you think? All right, so uh, I'm going to jump on that and just ask you an off-the-wall fucking random question, mm -hmm. Thomas. Are, are you ready? So what is, because I, I think about that all the time, too, you know. I mean, majority of the time I'm thinking about this, I'm definitely under the influence. But, um, <laughs> but like, what are we as people? I mean, I think about it all the time. Like, it's crazy. Like, what is this? Like, what is your view? What is this? This... Life. The Life. World. The world around us is whatever we make it. The world around us is... I mean, if you're talking about, you know, just the physical things in the world, then mm -hmm. they're just that, physical things. If you're talking about the... Say a lot, or if you're talking about the uh, metaphorical aspects of life, then it is the journey to find the purpose of life, which, and I'm going to say this because you breached this topic, you work as a mortician. What if I told you your line of work unlocks? Could it could very well show you the meaning of life? It does. What's the meaning of life, Mister Bruce? Take it. You work nearby a cemetery, yes? Yes. Next time you can, take a stroll down that at cemetery. Take a stroll down the cemetery. Look down, and carefully read the headstones. Normally, on every headstone, what you will find, you will find the words R.I.P. Rest in Peace, the person's name, their date of birth, and, and the year of death, Correct. and you will find something, something along the lines of either beloved, beloved husband and dad, beloved I love husband, you, something, yes. beloved mother, or loving mother, devoted father devoted husband, perhaps even a profession. You could take this even a step further if you don't want to go to a cemetery, find a newspaper, and flip to a little column called the obituaries, where you can actually find a lot more details about a person that might not be in a headstone. But what this all boils down to, Mr. Bruce, they are being listed for things, acts, or ways they have served someone else. And now notice, they don't, they're not always going to be firefighter, sheriff, um, fucking ex, fucking marine veteran. But they all served in some way to have some sort of impact on someone else's life to serve their life. And build with them. That is the point. To serve. And to build something. For someone else. That's your entire but, okay, point. But, but how about the motherfuckers who. Don't serve. And who don't build anyone. Some of the, how about the motherfuckers who. Tear down other people's. I mean, yes they do have a purpose. Because I mean. Or they're, they're impacting someone's life. But what, what about them? Well, it would depend on that person. Because maybe they, even they still have a way, uh, still are benefiting someone's life, even if they're detrimenting someone else's. The idea, Mr. Bruce, is that it does not matter how big or small your active service is. What matters 
is that you did something for someone other than yourself. It's always important. In some way. There you go. That's, that's Your entire purpose of life. And that I goes for your... anyone watching. That goes for the folks home watching. Um. Yes, the unholy corpse child gives you the meaning of life. Yes. <laughs> and I love your view on the meaning of life, my friend. That was a good one. Now, I am about to talk to you a horror ball question. Okay. Um, I think it's common knowledge news in the indie horror community that um, some things came up with when it came to the the owner of, of Psychotoxin Press, Christopher Pelton. Some allegations, some things came up. And well, he's no longer in charge. And um, a lot of authors have stepped down from Psychotoxin Press. I am one of them. Can, can you shine a light on that for us? I know you All can't right, probably so talk about everything, but... I cannot, and I cannot mm -hmm. divulge names. Yes, that's um, perfectly fine. Uh, aside from the owner, Christopher Pelton... As you have said, it is common knowledge that he has been, that he has had allegations made against him. Um, I was not present in Virginia during the time of the alleged events, but people that were contacted me as it was happening. Um, wow. Yes. And what I was told was that Chris was stoned off his ass and that the person he was with was incoherent. De like, completely um, out of her mind and she couldn't form a coherent sentence she was she was paranoid shaking and I was told that Chris had until 5 a.m. to remove himself from the premises or he would be removed by the hotel staff. And the story has it that he went around knocking on people's doors and begging them for money. He has since denied this, although I distinctly remember him making a post on Facebook asking saw, for money saw, saw before 5 a.m. So he has contradicted his own defense. Um... He has challenged anyone to contact hostel, hotel staff um, to ask them if they had tried to remove him. And of course, that's not indicative of anything because hotel staff won't, won't divulge that information. Um, but from what I was told... He had given this per the victim a soda, an open soda, and just shortly after drinking it, began feeling effects of some sort of some sort of hallucinogen. She does at at this time. She does not remember anything. But it was, I was told she was found um, partially undressed. He was. And once again, and real quick, once again, ladies and gentlemen, these are allegations. No one has not been found guilty or not guilty yet. But these are the allegations that are out. Right. And as far as I know, no case has been launched but several people several people have come forward 
at least to attest that Chris was begging for money. And two people were there with the victim when this happened. And again, I was immediately called and notified. Because, because I was the only, I was the only yeah, one they knew to trust. And at this time, um, everyone within Psychotoxin Press was already in an uproar because of a very derogatory to post Chris had made under the company's banner um, yes. trying to throw shade at two people who had been sort of at war with us, um, which is a whole different thing, but it did lead up to this, to the downfall of psychotoxin. So I want to ask you a question about that. <clears throat> Cause I mean, I mean, you, you were Christopher's right hand man. Tends to have psychotoxin to a, to a very uh, certain extent, yeah. and there are there is a lot to that, Mister Bruce. Yeah. Um, because this victim was not the only one; it was the only one that he had gone this far with, but not the only one he was attempting to. I have proof wow. of that too. Wow! But one the of them actually being my partner behind my wow. back and he and when i gave him the chance to try and come clean about this he did not he stood on his righteous high ground i'm sorry i'm getting i'm starting to lose my temper <laughs> you're fine you're fine but 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 the sad thing about this is there's a lot of collateral damage because i mean you know i've interviewed a lot of amazing authors um who are who are you know having to work published by cyclotoxin and a lot of them are being, you know, they don't know what to do. They're they're in this limbo place, like, and a lot of them are pulling their work, and and unfortunately, I mean, there's a outside of the allegations. I mean, there's a good team. There's a good nucleus still there with psychotoxin, and they're trying to push everything forward. I mean, I mean Jackie and I have a brain freeze. Jen, ja Jackie and Jen are. I mean, they're doing a great job to keep things moving here. I mean, and I think, you know, they're a great management team to move psychotoxin in, 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 into the future. But, well, it you would know, not just follow up. Um, It'll have to be something else, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, and that was the idea. Um, they wanted to completely rebrand because Chris had tainted the name. Yeah. Um, but for me and for my partner, it was... It was simply a sake of, even with a new face and a new flesh, but still the old bones. And those bones had been tainted forever. And now, we just couldn't do it. it we had to. And Fortunately, I was already in, plugged in with Unveiling Nightmares Press, who released uh, Skin That Screams. Unveiling Nightmare Crystal, they're excellent. Yes, yes she is a godsend, Travis. Yes. Now, now you guys were at war. I guess so I want to trip back to So watching on social media, like, and you know, I'm sitting back like, uh, every once in a while I'll be watching. So, like, you guys were at war with another publisher. I'm not going to say his name. Um, but it got really fucking this nasty. This person, oh, sir, there are screenshots that prove this person had planned all of that. All, way before I even really knew him. Oh, why did you guys... Because Chris... But why did you guys play along with that game? Because it was definitely a game. I just don't understand why you guys played along with that game. Well, okay. Here's the thing. For all the things he has been, for all the nasty things he has been called, and rightfully so, he wasn't stupid. He knew what he was doing. And he knew how to execute it in a way that none of us would have seen coming until it was too late. He had 
essentially had it out for Chris. Um, all because I believe it had something to do with not letting him on his podcast for some reason on the Horror Connection. I don't know why. Either that or it was something about Chris rejecting one of his submissions. And something to do with his debilitating condition. He believed that it was prejudice somehow. And used that to then plot a way to infiltrate and then slander all of Psychotoxin. And he did so using me and my partner in an interview. Because we were told that we were going to be interviewed for publicity for a magazine project me and her were starting. What we later found out was this was literally just, just an espionage tactic that he would then use against us. And in that time, he had pissed off somebody in the HWA. Um, somebody my partner was friends with. And unfortunately, despite being a grown man, he went with the elementary school idea of, if you're friends with them, you cannot be friends with me, you must be my enemy, get the hell out. And when, so I was notified of this, and when I tried to talk to him about it, he wanted to say that my partner, my girlfriend, was the cause of his stress because he said something nice about this person, about how they've always loved their work, because they have, and that must mean that they're in cahoots against him. And despite my partner during that little feud losing a lot, losing partnerships, losing poss losing projects because she wanted to fight for him, her friend, and he did that to her. And when I realized that's what kind of man this was, that's when I got involved. And I let him have it. And I took I had no mercy with what I said. And I did not care entire I did not entirely care if people wanted to view me differently because of it. But at the same time I showed proof that this man was a scumbag. And and to this day he will try to defend saying that I had disclosed confidential um, conversations despite being promising that I wouldn't, which I never did. That is never That was never in writing or even in verbal. So, no, they were fair game. And so then Chris got involved in that, and yeah. The piss of war began. Exactly. One it wasn't question. until okay, yes. it, it like wasn't my... until much mm -hmm. later when a former friend of that person had had found themselves shunned by him because they started trying to talk sense to him. It wasn't until then that we found out this was all a planned attack. And Listen, it it definitely whatever happened, it definitely worked because because I mean the the the, the statement that that um, that was made by psychotoxin on the social media that that, that was that was controversial. That's something like two hundred fucking views and comments, not positive ones. Was that um, I wonder if fat ugly chicks like TBI guys, which is um, yeah. Yep, and That's this was actually that was actually in reference to someone he had allied himself with who had already uh, who already had me and Chris in their crosshairs um, for very very the wrong reasons um, who is now also finding themselves under pressure from my supporters because 
they have tendencies to exude, let's say, psychotic behaviors um, when you reject their romantic, their lustful advances. And I'm not the only author either. There are several other authors. I can name two, but I won't. And, and a final question, any ill will towards the new psychotoxin team, or are you wishing them luck? Not at all. I believe the new that team, if they are still trying to do something with it, if they are trying to completely rebrand it, I believe they can, and I believe they would be able to build a much brighter and much more productive future. But it will be without me and my partner. I will wish them the best of luck. But we cannot be a part of that ever again. Thomas, where can yes. everyone find your book? And where can everyone find you as well? You can find Skin That Screams on Amazon in both ebook and paperback and on Godless. Um, you, as for me, you can of course find me on Facebook under my regular or profile, Thomas Stewart, or you can be a dearest maggot or larvae and join my Corpse Child Sanctuary Facebook page. You can find me on Instagram at Corpse Child 2001. And as of recently, you can find me on Slasher at Unholy Corpse Child. And under the same name, you can find me on TikTok. Or, if you really want to prove yourself or oh, to my high following, you can and join me in the sanctuary at www.corpschildsanctuary.com. You can sign up for my newsletter and get a free ebook. Or, or, you can visit the Citadel where you can purchase all of my books directly, either ebooks, which will be cheaper than you can find on Amazon, or signed paperbacks that come with a bookmark and free art print. It's a pleasure, pleasure. By the way, I just want to let the audience know, anyone who's watching this, this interview was scheduled way before shit hit the fan with cyclotoxins. So I'm not trying to get no fucking scoop or starting or shit, but I had to ask the, the questions because it happened so, and, and i feel like everybody needs to know at least your side of the story listen yes. everybody get on amazon godless wherever you can get your books and definitely please grab a copy of skin that fucking screams i fucking love that title man i love that title you should and see the cover ahead. i saw the cover you, you sent me a picture of it it looks it'll it looks like disturbing <laughs> Christy Listen, Aldridge, yeah, well, she did amazing. It is amazing. Everybody, please follow my man, the Holy Corpse Child himself, Thomas Stewart, on, on Instagram and Facebook and all forms of social media. Thomas, it's been a blast having you on, brother. Yes, you too, Mr. Bruce. Have a nice night. <laughs> you too. Everyone, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis it's Bruce. That's the Unholy Corpse Child. We'll see you next time. Take care.